here. Before we open the word of God for today, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. O loving and everlasting Father, I come to thee now, O Lord, and asking for a fresh and filling of thy Holy Spirit, which I do not deserve, praying that thou wilt empty me of anything that is unlike thee, so that thou canst be all in all in me. And that as I speak thy word, Lord, it will not be me speaking, it will be thy Holy Spirit speaking through me. It will be thy words and not mine. It will be thy thoughts and not my thoughts. And it will be a message, Lord, that will teach us about the constraining love of Christ and how it ought to compel us and impel us to reach others for Jesus and to live for him. We thank thee and we praise thee for what thou art about to do asking all these things in the glorious and gracious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. If you take a good look around you in the world today, you'll notice something interesting. You'll notice that the world is preoccupied with many things. Technological gadgets, politics, stock markets, sports outcomes, sickness, Poverty, weather. It's also occupied and preoccupied with many people. Trump, Trudeau, children, families, opinions, Duterte. I figured I'd add that one in. The church today is also preoccupied. Church is preoccupied with how to reach the lost but we are not reaching them as much as we ought. I'm not saying we're not reaching them. I'm saying we're not reaching them as much as we can reach them. The church is preoccupied with how to keep the saved, but we are not keeping them as much as we ought and can. We need to notice that the Bible does not say, be preoccupied till I come. It says, occupy. Till I come. What ought we to occupy ourselves with? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Paul gives the overarching motivation for everything that he does in ministry. And we want to look at it in three ways. Constraining love, cross-inspired conviction, and Christ-like life. Firstly, constraining love. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul has just finished telling them that they are groaning in this tabernacle. They're, they're looking forward and earnestly desiring to be in heaven when Jesus comes. They're earnestly groaning and walking by faith, not by sight. They would rather be with the Lord than be on the earth but they labor for him because he compels them to. And in verse 11 now he begins and he says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but are made manifest unto God, and I trust are also made manifest in your consciences. That word terror is phobos. In the Greek it means fear. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. What is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord, according to the Bible, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Walking in the fear of God is to walk with God in peace, in joy, and in righteousness. It is a pleasant thing. It is a wonderful thing. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the SDA commentary says in location, he who stands in awe of God can be free of all anxiety. The fear of the Lord is reverent adoration and obedient respect for a loving heavenly father. And so Paul is saying, knowing this fear, knowing this relationship with Christ, knowing this connection to Jesus, we persuade, we endeavor to persuade men. That is, we endeavor to convince them, to assure them, to lead them to trust in Christ and the peace that surpasseth understanding. Knowing how wonderful this fear is, knowing how beautiful it is to walk in the fear of God, we're seeking to convince men and to assure them that this is the best life possible that they could ever live. 
This fear involves not only the terror of refusing such a loving invitation to forgiveness of sin, salvation, and holiness, but the source of this invitation, which is the love that constrains us to seek and to save the lost, no matter what. We are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Notice, we're made manifest unto God. He knows about us. We manifest ourselves to Him, meaning we present our bodies living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service and worship. Meaning that God sees us and leads us and notices us because we are doing His will and His work. Not only did God notice the Apostle Paul, but the devil did too. Remember Siva and his seven sons? Remember when they tried to exorcise the demon out of that man and they went into the house and they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of him. And the demon turns around and he says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You're not rocking the kingdom of Satan enough to be known by Satan, then you have a problem. Paul was manifest to God, therefore he was manifest to the principalities and powers of darkness. And he says, we trust, I trust that we're also made manifest in your own consciousness. Notice, he doesn't want himself to be manifested in the sense that people look at him on an outward perspective and they like how he looks or they like how he talks or they like what he's all about on the outside. He says, we want to be manifested in your consciences so that every time you think of us, you think of the fact that you are compelled to follow Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 12, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. This manifestation, he says, in your conscience, is this, this idea of thinking about us in terms of the conscience, in terms of what is right and shunning what is wrong, it does not involve commending ourselves to you again. It doesn't involve having to tell, us about, tell you about ourselves all the time. Tell you how educated we are. Tell you how bright we are, how eloquent we are. Tell you how uh, uh, amazing we are. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want you to give you occasion to glory on our behalf so that when you think of us, you're not glorifying us, you're glorifying God. And not only are you glorifying God, but you have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance, not in the heart. And beloved, that's what we ought to be glorying in today, in what is in the heart. One may appear to be a Christian and may even glory in the appearance, but in the heart, he's full of dead men's bones. But if we begin to glory in the heart and we begin to seek the things of the heart, we begin to seek to have a new heart and renew a right spirit within us, then we are glorying in the right thing because out of the heart proceeds everything else. Out of the heart are the issues of life. And therefore, if the heart is corrupt, even if the works appear good on the outside, they are corrupt also. But if the heart is pure, then everything that comes out of a pure heart is pure also. To the pure, all things are pure. Verse 13, now he deals with some of the accusations that they've been getting in the preaching of the gospel. He says, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. To be beside yourself means to be crazy in King James Version language. So whether we're crazy, we're crazy to God. That was, in a sense, saying that people accuse us of being crazy. They accuse us of being out of our minds for the things that we talk about. And don't you know today, whenever you start telling people about Jesus, some of them will think you're crazy. But don't worry about it. Paul says, if we're nuts, it's to God. We're not concerned with what men think about us. We're concerned with where God stands before us, where what God thinks about us is what matters. And so therefore, he says, whether we're beside ourselves, it is to God. Whether we be sober, whether we be sober that is serious, aware, awake, undrunken, unintoxicated, it is for your cause. So when we appear serious and sober-minded and awake and unintoxicated, it's for your cause. When we appear in this sense, it's for you. Why? And here comes the verse, verse 14. For the love of Christ 
constraineth us. The love of Christ constraineth us. That word constraineth means to hold together. The love of Christ holds us together. So we don't lose our minds with all the things that are happening around us. So that we don't lose our, our, our encouragement and our confidence and our joy in the Lord. The love of Christ holds us together, not only personally, but corporately. It holds us together. It binds us together so that we can love one another with a holy love, with a perfect love, with a righteous love. But that word also means to compress, to compel, to urge, to preoccupy. We're preoccupied with the love, the constraining love of Christ. What kind of love is this? The love of Christ. How was it demonstrated? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Talking about the fact that Jesus offered himself once. And it says, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He has appeared. For what purpose did he appear? To put away sin. By what means? By the sacrifice of himself. Here you see the secret of overcoming sin, beloved. The sacrifice of self. The death of self. Because it is the same death that Jesus had to die in order for it to be possible through his righteousness, through his power, for us to slay, for him to slay self within us. So he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. He suffered the pain of the flesh. He suffered the pain of insult. He suffered the, the, the sting of mockery. He, stuff, he suffered the sting of shame. And he also suffered the injuries of the cross in the flesh. For who? For us. For you. He suffered. He didn't deserve to suffer. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for you. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He was just in his, even in the suffering, he was just. And why did he suffer for me, who am unjust, who is unjust, who has no justice, who has no righteousness, who is a sinner? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, His own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He took upon himself the, 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 the defilement, the disgust, the dirt, the consequence of sin upon himself. He who was spotless and holy and harmless and undefiled took upon himself the spot of sin for me. And he took it on the tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, the law says. He became a curse for us that we might be made the blessedness of God in him. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Romans 4, 25, it says he was delivered for our offenses. They delivered him up to this suffering, to this reproach, to this death. They delivered him up for our offenses, and he was willing to be delivered. He gave himself for our offenses. You see that sin here is called an offense. It is an offense to God. It is offensive to God. Why? Because it caused the death of His only begotten Son. Therefore, we should hate sin. Ask God to give us a perfect hatred for sin so that we can hate sin with a perfect hatred because God hates sin because of what it did to His Son and also for what it has done to His creation. Amen. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says, He gave Himself for us. And Galatians 1.4 says he gave himself for our sins. And Isaiah 53.5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Wounded and bruised. So not only hurt on the cross with the nail spikes going through his wrists, but wounded in the sense that his whole life was a life of woundedness. His whole life 
was a life where he was wounded constantly by the sinners of this world who were not worthy of him. And he was bruised constantly for our sins, for our iniquities. And the Bible calls sins iniquity there. This is a deep, dirty abomination before God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, it says Christ died for our sins. And in Romans 5, 6, it says Christ died for the ungodly. So sin and ungodliness are synonymous. What does it mean to be ungodly? It means to be unlike God in character. It means to be unlike Him, to be the opposite of Him. That is sinfulness. Whenever we behave in a way that does not reflect the holiness and the righteousness and the character of God, we are ungodly. And Jesus died for that. This holy love of Christ pressed upon the conscience of Paul day and night. It moved him to sacrifice his comforts. It moved him to sacrifice his desires, his agendas. It moved him to sacrifice his longings, his likes, his ambitions. That Christ might be all in all. That Christ might be preached. That Christ might be known. That Christ might be demonstrated. To the lost. Oh, beloved, is this my life? Is this your life today? If not, then something else is preoccupying us. Perhaps our lusts, perhaps our comforts, perhaps our desires, perhaps the opinions of men, perhaps our bills. What are all these things compared to the spotless and beautiful love of Jesus Christ? What are they? They're nothing compared to that. And yet they preoccupy us. And what is the result? The love of the world begins to constrain us, begins to pressure us, to press us, to preoccupy us, to satisfy the lust of the flesh, to satisfy the lust of the eyes, to satisfy the pride of life. We're pressed to sin because we're preoccupied with the world. What is the result? The Bible says the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What a difference. To aim for eternity instead of wasting your time agonizing for the temporal that is here one day and gone tomorrow. We need this constraining love because if we don't have it, then our faith is dead. If we don't have it, then the, the love of Christ doesn't compel us so we do, you notice, and then we end up doing things for God, not compelled by the love of Christ, not constrained by the love of Christ, but forced to do everything. Constraining and force are two different, very different things. And so we need to love Jesus the way the soldier's life in, wife in Cromwell's time did. The history, the annals of history tell us of a woman whose husband was a soldier in Oliver Cromwell's army. That soldier has, had deserted his post and had done something worthy of death. And so she came and she begged Cromwell and his generals to spare this man's life. And Cromwell said, no, it's not going to happen. As soon as the curfew bell rings, there was a bell for curfew, he will then be hanged. And she did something unbelievable to demonstrate her love for her husband. She went up to that bell and she grabbed that bell right by the post that rings the bell. And when the sexton or the bell ringer went up, and he was deaf, the bell ringer, he went up and he pulled the rope so the, rope could, so the bell could ring to, to signal curfew, was, which was the signal that this man was ready to die. And nobody heard a bell. And that woman's body was knocked back and forth into that steel apparatus until she was bruised and battered and bloody. The bell ringer thought he had rung the bell, so he went his way after he had given it a few good shots. And then the woman crumpled to the floor, bleeding and gasping and bruised, limped her way to Cromwell. And Cromwell came by that time to that place where she was, and he was like, where's the bell? Haven't heard the bell ring for curfew. And he saw this woman, bruised and bloodied, walk up to him and explain what had happened and her love for her husband. And Oliver Cromwell's heart was touched. It was stirred within him. And he said, 
That kind of love that you have demonstrated for your husband is worthy of forgiveness. He's pardoned. Go home. Your husband lives. The curfew bell will not ring tonight. But you see, she was willing to suffer. She was willing to go through pain. She was willing to be bruised and battered so that her husband could live. And that's just a smattering of what Christ did for us. But that should be what our attitude would be for Christ, shouldn't it? If He loved us that much, what, what can we go through in this world of discomfort that can equal the value of that love? What can we suffer for His name's sake that would ever equal the value of that love? What is it that we can sacrifice to use that word for that love? Nothing, right? We should be willing and able to go through anything for Christ because the love of Christ constrains us. Secondly, he talks about the cross-inspired conviction. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Notice what it says there. After it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all died, then we're all dead. If one died for all, then we're all dead. And the SDA Bible commentary explains the meaning of this. Talks about the fact that in taking Adam's place, Christ became the head of the human race and died on the cross as its representative. Thus, in a sense, when he died, the entire race died with him. As he represented all men, so his death stood for the death of all. In him, all men died. He paid the full, in full the claims of the law. His death was adequate to pay the penalty for all sin. But this does not mean universal salvation. For each individual sinner must accept the atonement provided by the Savior in order to make it effective in his own case. But the good news is, the atonement has been provided for everybody. Because when he died on that cross, the sting of sin died with him. The power of sin died with him. The, 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 the strength of sin to, to imprison mankind, to exploit mankind died with him. And he made an open show of the principalities and powers of darkness, and he disarmed them on that cross. The commentary continues, not only did the death of Christ provide an atonement for sin and thereby deliver repentant sinners from the second death, it also made possible their dying to their depraved, unregenerate nature and their rising to walk in newness of life. Because he died on the cross, I can die to self and sin through him. I'm also dead. I have to claim the atonement, claim the death of Christ so that my nature, which is depraved and unregenerate, can rise to walk in newness of life, can die and then rise again. Paul's declaration of consecration is doubtless an expression of, of the decision which he came at conversion, which he came to at conversion, ever since the great truth of Christ's atonement has been the motivating and controlling factor in his life. Is it for you? Is it? Does that motivate you? We have decided, Paul says, we are convicted, Paul says, that if one died for all, then all died, we're all dead. And so on the cross, sin, sting, and victory died in lieu of our acceptance, and we all can be dead to sin and alive unto righteousness. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 in connection to this. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Death reigned by one, but those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, verse 18, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall be many be made righteous. So by Christ comes abundant grace, righteousness, 
to be able to rule over sin and not have sin rule over you. Through Christ comes the free gift of justification of life by His righteousness. And through Christ comes the power to obey because we can claim His obedience as our obedience to be made righteous. What a love that is. Is anything missing? Can He provide anything else? No, He can't. He's given us everything. What a message we have to give to the world then in view of these realities. The gospel, therefore, in view of these beautiful scriptural realities, the gospel is a powerful declaration inspired by a cross-inspired conviction and the constraining holy love of Christ. We're here to declare the gospel, not to try to make people believe it by our methodology and our psychology and our emotionalism. We're here to declare it, and God does the rest. The Holy Spirit then steps into the heart of men and changes the heart of men. We're here to declare this beautiful, joyous, exciting, and solemn truth to the world. We must declare that sin has been defeated on the cross, and righteousness reigns supreme in the heavenly sanctuary. What a declaration that is. It's not an if, and, or but. It's not a maybe. It's happened. It's happening. It will happen. It can happen in your life when you receive Him. Today we're so busy trying to prove the existence of God that we don't realize we don't need to prove the existence of God. We just need to live for God and His existence will become very manifest to the world. We must live in this victory in Christ if our declaration is going to have that power that the Apostle Paul and the early apostles had. We must, as Paul did, preach and witness in this holy confidence, in this holy concern, in this holy consecration. But we're too busy today, preoccupied with how we're going to do it. And God is saying, don't worry about the how, just submit to me and do it. Let me do it through you. That's the method. What is relevance? You know, people talk about relevance today. It's kind of funny to me. They say, oh, we have to be relevant. You are relevant. Are you living in the 21st century? Are you alive right now, today? Are you living for Christ today? Then you're relevant. That's relevance. It's how we live a Christ-like life in the 21st century is relevance. And when people see that, they will see what Christ has done for us. And so we have a powerful message. We have a cross-inspired, convicting message. We have a message that is to be lived and loved and declared and constrained by the love of Jesus Christ. And then people will come alive and they will see that there is a power in us that cannot be explained by men. That cannot be explained by men. It cannot be reasoned out by man-made methods. It cannot be reasoned out by psychology or psychiatry. It cannot be reasoned out by philosophy. It is a change that nobody can explain. And they must look to God to receive it. Just as they did back then. And thirdly and finally, it woos us, this constraining love of Christ, to a Christ-like life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 15 and 16. Notice what it says there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 15 and 16. And that he died for all, because he died for everyone, because he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. To live unto him. Because he died for them, they ought to live for him. Simple, isn't it? But yet do we do that? Do we do it? Are we doing it? Are we living for Him or are we living for something else? Are we living for Christ or are we living for fame? Are we living for fortune? Are we living for money? Are we living for acknowledgement from the world? Are we living for, and you can add that list ad infinitum. What are we living for? Who are we living for? People say, oh, my children are my life, my family is my life. No, sorry, 
Your children are precious. They're treasures. They're wonderful. But Christ is your life. And if you don't have Christ's love in you, you'll never be able to love that child the way Christ would have you love them and the way they deserve to be loved. Don't put your focus on the wrong thing or on the wrong person. Put your focus on Jesus Christ. Live unto Him. I want you to notice something in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, that gives us a very interesting principle. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. The Word of God there says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So how do we partake of the divine nature? What is the divine nature? It's the nature of Christ. It's His righteousness. It's His fullness. It's His greatness. It's His joy. It's His peace. How do we partake of the divine nature? Claiming the precious promises. And what are the promises based on? Christ. Christ's coming to this world. Christ coming again. Christ ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Christ dying on the cross. All these things we read are promises. And if we believe them, and if we come to them with, with aching hearts, confessing our sins before God, making things right with Him, and then claiming these precious promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. But how do we become partakers of the corruption that is in the world? Notice the second part. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Lust. Inordinate affection. Ungodly covetousness. Desiring something that we should not have or placing undue uh, uh, emphasis on something that even might be good, but placing that something above Christ. We become partakers of the corruption in the world through lust, but we become partakers of the precious promises, partakers of the divine nature by the precious promises of the Word of God. Now let me ask you, what do you and I spend most of our time doing and desiring? The promises of God or the lusts of the flesh? And you take a good look at the world around you today, beloved. Take a good look at the world around you. It's all about what you lust and you desire, isn't it? Oh, don't you want this? The iPhone 10, 11, 12, where are we now? 12, 15? I don't even know. Couldn't care. Yeah, thank you. X, X, of course. Ran out of numbers. Now they got to put letters. Okay, so. <laughs> don't you want this new contraption? Look what it can do. Oh, yes, I want it. Lust, corruption. Hmm? You buy this car, people will say, hey, this guy's loaded, you know. You wear this dress, you buy this item, you're going to look good. People are going to like the way you look physically. Eh? Attraction, lust, corruption. Everything is based on that desire, that inordinate desire. The devil rules in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He's still doing it. So you and I have to extricate ourselves through the grace of Christ and through His power. Extricate ourselves from these lusts. And dwell on the promises of God. The promise to live in peace and in joy and in righteousness. The promise to stand for God though the heavens fall. The promise to dwell on His holy word. The promise that we have that He can make us new creations and new creatures. And He can make us new people. And He can give us the joy and the strength and the wisdom that we need to witness for Him in this world. That's where I want to dwell. I dwell in anything else. I become empty, I become depressed, I become weak. I dwell on the promises of God, I become strong, I become joyful, and no matter what I go through, I can go through it because Christ is going through it with me. You see how powerful that is? The promises are powerful. We need to dwell on them more often. What has God promised to do? He's promised to convict He's promised to reach the lost. He's promised that his gospel will go out into this world, will be preached all over the world, and then the end will come. Isn't that a beautiful promise? Don't we want to be a part of that promise? We can't be if we're dwelling on the lusts. Can't. 
And so that's why the Apostle Paul says, since he died for me, since he exemplified that love for me, that constraining love, what am I going to do in response now? What can I do in response to that love? I need to live unto him, which died and rose again. Live for him. Live to please him. Because when Jesus was on this earth, it is said of him, even Christ pleased not himself. Live to love him, not to love self. Live to obey him, not self. Live to glorify him, not glorify myself. Live to lift him up, not lift myself up. Live to glorify his name, not glorify my name. Live to preach and to teach him and to exemplify him to the world. That's the change. That's conversion. That's what real conversion is. If we don't have that seed, beloved, that's be, that, that, that spark that's fanning into a, a flame, we have to question where we are with Christ. Listen to what he says. Well, listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says, actually, here. Letter 97, 1898. The love of Christ in the heart is what is needed. Self is need, in need of being crucified. When self is submerged in Christ, true love springs forth spontaneously. It is not an emotion or an impulse, but a decision of a sanctified will, love is. It consists not in feeling, but in the transformation of the whole heart, soul, and character, which is dead to self and alive to God. Our Lord and Savior asks us to give ourselves to Him. Surrendering self to God is all He requires. Giving ourselves to Him to be employed as He sees fit. Because if you look at the one great quality that characterized the first century church, that made them men and women of power and of might and of wisdom and, 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 and of, of, of the way they declared the gospel at that time. What was it? It was that they were totally sold out and surrendered to God. That's what it was. It was the fact that they could come to God and say, Use me, Lord. I'm here for thy will. I am thine, O Lord. Use me. I'm dead to self. Whenever thou hast need of me, Lord, call upon me. I will put everything else aside and be available for thee, Lord. And they meant it. And they sacrificed everything so that they could do what God asked them to do. Now what's the result? Notice the result. It's beautiful. Of this living unto Christ. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh... Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. This is a whole sermon in itself, but just to summarize. Paul now estimates men from Christ's point of view according to their character and attitude towards spiritual things, according to the SDA commentary. Paul now sees people the way Christ sees them according to their character and attitude towards spiritual things. He doesn't he stopped looking at the physical now. He has stopped looking at people and sizing them up based on their education. He stopped sizing people up based on their nationality. He stopped sizing them up based on their wealth or lack thereof, based on their position in society, based on human approbation or what people say about them. He doesn't look at people that way anymore. He looks at people the way Christ looks at them. And would to God we would do the same. But we can't unless we live unto Him. Because if we live for the flesh, we're going to look at people according to the flesh, right? If we live according to the lust of the flesh, we'll look at others according to lust. If we live for money, we'll look at people according to money. You notice, whatever people live for, that's how they see others. If they're very educated, they say, ah, he's not educated enough. Or, wow, he's really educated. I'm going to follow him. To their own destruction sometimes. Oh, he's richer than I am. I'm going to find out how he made that extra money because I'm already rich, but I want more. Right? That's how people look. But when you come to Christ, you don't look at people like that anymore. Why? Because there's nothing in you responding to those things anymore. And this is the beautiful thing of being in Christ. This is why he says in verse 16, we, though we have known Christ after the flesh, 
Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Some people speculate that Paul may have seen Christ in the flesh. But that's not what he means here ultimately. He says, I don't look at Jesus in the flesh anymore because how did the Jews look at Jesus when he came to the world? He was a rabbi, right? He had followers. He was an Israelite. He was all these things. So they looked at him according to the flesh and they missed the matchless beauty of Christ because they were looking at him from the perspective of the flesh. They were looking at him in all these areas and notice he disappointed them in every one of them. Isn't it amazing how Christ came to this world? Education, he didn't have official education. He was educated on his mother's knee with the Holy Scriptures. That's true education. He didn't have a degree, so he disappointed them in that. But he was wise above everyone else. He came to this earth, his nationality, he was from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was like the East L.A., the Bronx, the Wally of the day. <laughs> In other words, it was a bad place, if none of you understood any of those other terms. It was a really bad place. Crime and evil. It says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yes, Jesus Christ came out of Nazareth. And today, many people are coming to Jesus Christ out of the most wicked places because they have found him whom their soul loves. Was he wealthy? No, he was poor. Didn't even have a place to lay his head. What was his position in society? He disappointed them there too. He was just a carpenter's son. And what were people saying about him? Oh, people were so confused. Some say, you're that prophet. Some say you're this, some say you're a teacher come from God, some say you're a deceiver, some say you're a charlatan, some say you're fake. He disappointed them in everything because he wanted them to see that he was God in the flesh. They wanted them to see his divine character. And today we need to see him that way as well. He wasn't a, just a great teacher, he wasn't a philosopher, he wasn't just another holy man. It was God in the flesh. In character, attitude towards spiritual things, Jesus Christ excelled everybody. So who is Christ for you today? How do you see him? Manuscript 16, 18, 90. Look to Christ. Behold the attractive loveliness of his character. And by beholding, you will become changed into his likeness. The mist that intervenes between Christ and the soul will be rolled back as we by faith look past the hellish shadow of Satan and see God's glory in his law and in the righteousness of Christ. Satan is seeking to veil Jesus from our sight, to eclipse his light. For when we get even a glimpse of his glory, we are attracted to him. Sin hides from our view that matchless charms of Jesus Prejudice, selfishness, self-righteousness, and passion blind our eyes so that we do not discern the Savior. Oh, if we would by faith draw nigh to God, He will reveal to us His glory, which is His character, and the praise of God will flow forth from human hearts and be sounded by human voices. You see, that's what He wants. What, what, what Satan wants was for you, is for you and I not to see the beauties of Christ, the charms of Christ, because He knows even if we catch a glimpse they will become so wonderful, so beautiful to us that sin will fade in the background. It'll be nothing. And then we will be like the Apostle Paul. The love of Christ constrained him. And he went out and he preached. And they stoned him. And he got up and he preached. And they beat him. And they insulted him. And they mocked him. And they did all kinds of things to him to trap him and to, to gossip about him and to put him down and to do all these things to him. But it didn't matter to him because the love of Christ surpassed all these other things. It constrained him. So nothing else mattered. Don't you want to live a life like that? So that when you're living for Christ, wherever you are in your workplace, in your family, in your home, whatever problems you're going through, those problems seem like nothing because the love of Christ constrains you, urges you, presses you, preoccupies you forward to glorify God. The love of Christ compelled Almachus, 
also known as Telemachus, whose story is found in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Almachus was so filled with sorrow at the thought of so many souls being damned and lost through the gladiatorial shows in Rome during that century that he visited Rome to stop them. One day the gladiators were fighting and all of a sudden they saw this figure come into the stage, sit on the seat, and then as he came from the seat, he went down into the middle of the auditorium, stood between the two gladiators and rebuked them for spilling innocent blood and told them to come to Christ. What a courageous deed because as soon as he did that, he then rebuked the crowd, he rebuked the emperor, and then the emperor ordered the gladiators to kill him and they killed him. And his blood flowed in the Colosseum. But something amazing happened as he died. And Fox picks, out, picks up what's happening here. It says, His spirit had been stirred by the sight of thousands flocking to see men slaughter one another. And in his simple-hearted zeal, he had tried to convince them of the cruelty and wickedness of their conduct. He had died, but not in vain. His work was accomplished at the moment he was struck down, for the shock of such a death before their eyes turned the hearts of the people. They saw the hideous aspects of the favorite vice to which they had blindly surrendered themselves. And from the day Telemachus fell dead in the Colosseum, no other fight of gladiators was ever held there. What a man. Simple. Today they call him crazy. They say, what are you doing? But you see, he was known as a man of God. They knew about him. They knew him because he was a praying man. He was a godly man. He was a man who lived for God. And when he went into that Colosseum, and they saw what their hatred and their blindness and their lust and their vice had done to such a man of God, it opened their eyes. And there were no more gladiatorial games. From January 1st, 404 AD, they stopped. Ah, but beloved, a greater death, a greater death occurred. Jesus, Jesus died on the cross. He came to this world. He stood between the dead and the living so that he could rebuke us for our sinfulness, our unrighteousness, our ungodliness. And his death should also abolish the fatal games that we're playing with God. Our sins and our lusts and our vices and our lies, this death, should also abolish the fatal games. This death should also change us from darkness to His marvelous light. So what do you say today? The appeal to you is, and to me, to submit to Christ. Surrender to Him. Even if you don't know Him today, even if you're here and you're not a Christian, to submit to God, to surrender to Him. Because he died on that cross for you. He died for you. Yes, for you. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone, he died for you so that you can be whole. And to us who already call ourselves Christians, to allow the love of Christ to constrain us. Nothing else. Nothing else. The holy love of Jesus should be our motivation for everything we do for him and for one another and in every area that he has placed us in. Do you want to say to God today, Lord, I've been constrained by many things. I've been pressed by many things. I've been pressured by many things. I've been pressured by the world. I've been pressured by the flesh, by the devil, by my lusts, by my covetousness. Today, I want to submit to the constraining love of Jesus Christ. I want that to be my constraint. I want that to be my preoccupation. If you want to say that to God today, I'm going to ask you to kneel as we seek His face. Oh Lord, what men and women 
has thy constraining love produced? The Apostle Paul, Telemachus, all these great men and women of God who have been constrained by thy love and have risked all to follow thee, to live for thee, to die for thee. And, O oh God, today we come to ask for thy forgiveness. For we have been constrained by something other than the love of Christ in many cases in our lives. We've been constrained with money. We've been constrained with lusts. We've been constrained with reputations. We've been constrained with gossip. We've been constrained with pride, selfishness, ego. We've been constrained by so many things and preoccupied with things that are useless in the end. Temporal, here today, gone tomorrow. And we have not allowed the love of Christ to constrain us, to preoccupy us, to press us, so that our motive for service will be a Christ-like motive, not a selfish motive. Today we have lived for self. In many cases we've lived for our ego. We've lived for our name to be exalted. We've lived, O oh God, that we might be preeminent, we might be in control, we might be the manipulators, the dominators. O oh God, forgive us. Let Christ come into our hearts, the arena of our hearts, and let him stand between the gladiators of our lusts, and let him take full sway, O oh Lord, casting them out so that he can reign supreme. Let him be the Telemachus, the end of the battle, so that we can fight the good fight of faith, that we can live for Christ, that we can follow him. O oh God, be with those who have knelt today because they want to receive Jesus. They want to be constrained by his love. They want to submit to him today. And lead them on a path where they can study thy word and prepare so that they can give their lives to Christ in baptism. And O oh God, we pray for us that are here today. Revive us, renew us, refresh us, reconvert us, O oh God. Give us new hearts. Give us new lives. Help us to live for thee. And may the constraining love of Christ be our overwhelming motivation for everything that we do and say, so that we can live unto him who died for us and rose again. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen.